how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. If I don't sing some, some people get mad. <laughs> he gave his life. Tell me what more can he give? and me mm. oh how he's blessed you Ooh, and me mm. oh how God bless you and me. Let me tell you what he's done. He gave his life. Tell me what more can he give? Oh, how he's blessed you. Something else I can tell you. Oh, how he's kept you. Hasn't God kept you? And me. Oh, 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 and I'm so glad when I think about what he did. Gave his life. Oh, tell me what more can he give? Oh, how he loved me. I can tell you all. Oh, Sing other stuff in old camp meeting songs. Amen. 
I can sing anything you want me to sing. All right. How we love it. All right. All right, today I, I'm going to pull away from just the great verses of the Bible and get back to that when I get past the day and next Sunday, great verses. But right now I want to preach something since it's anniversary time, pastoral anniversary. Knowing I won't be preaching next Sunday, pastor anniversary, I'm bringing my own anniversary sermon. I'm going to be talking about preaching today. So we're going now to Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20. And we're going to look at that famous verse. Jeremiah 20. Jeremiah is in the Old Testament. Consider one of the major prophets instead of the minor prophets. Verse 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, yes, talking about God now, yes, nor speak any more in his name. He's talking about God. Yes, Jeremiah, listen to what he's saying. He's mad. He's fussing. Yes, I'm going to read it again. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. You may be seated. I'm going to talk about the fire that won't let you quit. The fire that won't let you quit. How many of you ever felt like giving up? How many of you have felt like you just can't take it anymore? How many of you have feel like sometimes everything you've been doing is just seem like it's worthless? That is not coming to back to you in returns and good interest? That everything you try to do for some people, that everything you've done for some people, especially relatives and all the people you have helped, and it really gets you down, and you start saying, I'm not giving them another dime. I'm not lending nobody no more money. I'm not going to be trying to spend my time with people and helping them get up, because every time I help get somebody up, they get up and forget me. And then you sometimes say, you know, I'm not going to church anymore. I'm mad with God. Why did he let this happen to me? Why did he let my child die? Why did he let something happen to one of my kids? I raised them up in the church all my life. I prayed over them and look what happened. God, I'm mad with you. And I want to quit. And all of us get that quitting spirit. Here is a man in the Bible, a man of God, called of God, the weeping prophet. Want to quit. Here's a man is sitting down writing out his resignation. Saying, God, I'm not going to talk about you anymore. I don't want to call your name no more. I don't want to speak about you anymore. I'm mad at you. And I want to turn in my preaching license. <laughs> and bump these church folk. And I can't tell you sometimes I didn't say that too. <laughs> Sometimes I've gone out of here and said, bump this church. God, I'm finna retire. I'm old enough to retire. Say, Amen. I'm through with these colorful. They get on my nerve. They worry me to death. I can't get a, I can't please some of them. And I do my very best to preach, pastor, teach. And they won't come to nothing. They don't want to participate in nothing. Won't come to choir rehearsal. And then want to get up there and open their mouth not say nothing. And I've been preaching here 46 years. And I haven't heard some people say hallelujah yet. <laughs> and so many times you want to say, God, I'm through. And I really said that when he took my son off. Right. I said, God, now I, I'm gone. I said, you done took, you've taken away the, my joy, 
my oldest, walking like me, talking like me, preaching like me. And you only preached two years and you took him. I didn't even get a chance to see him in the last words. And I, the devil was saying, quit. God doesn't love you. How could he love you and do that? See? The devil was even telling me you ought to commit suicide. People don't know I grew up with him. We were 19 years old when we married, and I grew up with him. We grew up together. Yeah. My best friend was Ari. Yeah. All the nights we were in my study, we would share everything. Nobody I trusted like him. And God went at the very one that I was ready to give him this church and I was going to go on a worldwide crusade. Amen. The day I was, he was killed, I was in uh, New Orleans going to Shreveport, Louisiana to have my first crusade. The people were waiting on me and all of a sudden something turned me around and brought me home. Got home, word got your son just died. Now you can imagine, one preacher said, Fleming, when I saw you preach your son's funeral, there way in the world I could have stood there and taken it. I would have had to get in that casket with him if that would have been my son. I said, but the pain that I went through, nobody would know to stand there. And yes, I wanted to give up. I wanted to quit. But I had to remember something that Jeremiah thought. I can't quit. And the reason I couldn't quit, because of what's in my bone. Help me, Holy Ghost. The fire in your bones that makes you keep on going. Can I talk to you this morning? The fire in your bone that make you take what you don't want to take. The fire in your bone that makes you sometimes want to quit and walk out and you come right back. You have to have something greater than you to make you hang in there. And this is what you got in this prophet Jeremiah who had been called as a boy. He was a boy when God called him. And he tried to get out of it then. He told God, God don't call me, I'm too young. <laughs> I'm too young to preach. I, I don't want to preach to these people. But God said, I'm calling you. I'm anointing you. And I'm going to use you regardless to your age. Yeah. Have you ever heard people to tell you you're too young? Yeah. I heard that so much as a boy preacher. I remember one time I went to a, a church, a big church, and I was no higher than that. I had to stand on a box to preach. And I went to the pulpit, and when I was sitting in a chair, I felt so embarrassed because my feet wouldn't come to the floor. And people laughed. My little feet would be up in the chair. And I had sometimes sit on the edge of the chair so my feet would touch the pulpit. At one time, an old deacon saw me sitting up there with all of the pastors and said, come here, come here. I didn't know what he wanted. He kept, I went over there, he grabbed me by my arm and pulled me out of the pulpit but he sat me down beside him. That was so embarrassing. A boy up there preaching, what you doing up here in the pulpit? That hurt me so bad. I felt then, Lord, I'm not for this, but I couldn't get out of it. I don't know what happened. Wasn't no daddy preacher, no uncle preacher, nobody. First Fleming preacher in the family. I don't know where preaching came from. I just know my sister uh, made a statement, and it's been recorded before she died, that I used to go up there in the bathroom at five and six years old and lock up in that bathroom, and I was preaching. And sometimes I didn't know what I was saying, but just preaching. And they took... They went to my dad and said, Dad, we're going to have to take him to the doctor. We think something is mentally wrong with him. He up there making all that noise. I didn't know they knew that. I didn't know they were listening. And Daddy told him, that, well, I don't know what's wrong with him. Daddy, he up there, he up there again. I waited and went upstairs and got in that bedroom and went just preaching. And I said, where did this come from? And all of a sudden, I was a little boy, wasn't going to church. My mother, primitive Baptist, they didn't believe in boy preachers. And they told my mother if she didn't stop me, they would put her out to church. And I slipped away from my mother and went and joined the Baptist church. And my mother, when I was getting ready to get baptized, was out there in the yard trying to get me and stop me. I slipped out the back and couldn't stop me. 
because her church threatened her. The primitive Baptists didn't have Sunday school at that time. They believed in boy preachers. And if that was hard on me, I had to go sometime alone because she was threatened to be with me. Then they put out a lie. She just taking that boy going around preaching to make money. And my mama got embarrassed to go with me any further because she didn't have nothing to do with this. It was a calling. I couldn't get away from it. And when I got up to take, like, make a little Easter speech like little kids, and wasn't nobody there but kids practicing, I went to the pulpit and shut my eyes and went to stumping and preaching. Good. And when I opened my eyes, a whole room full of folk had heard a little boy preaching at Ross Street Baptist Church ran and they said, a kid is up there preaching. I just preached with my eyes shut because I was scared. And I opened my eyes, church full of people ran off the street and were just looking. And when the guy ready to give me a trial sermon, my pastor said he's too young. But an old preacher lived across the street named Reverend Dantley. They ran and got him and said, this boy is preaching during the Easter's practice speech. And he got on my pastor and wore him out. Don't you stand in the way of that child. You better give him a trial sermon. And that Friday night, that little church was packed. And I got up. And had to stand on the floor because they couldn't see me in the pulpit. And I preached, must have been an hour, stomping and preaching. My subject was Jesus died. Never will forget. And a lady was here, a member, I never see, she was there that night. That's been about 58 years ago. When you're called, you just call. When you've been sent and not went. You have to just go. And I could never quit preaching. I felt like it. A lot of times you feel like doing things, but you won't do it. Because there's something in your bone. This, this sermon got to be personal because of next, next week they'll be talking about me. But I'm letting you know it wasn't me. That it's the fire that God put in you. That no matter who went with me, I went by myself. And as a member here in my church, Bernice, remember me when I was her 13-year-old youth pastor. And she was a little girl then, and now she's a faithful member here. She remember me coming to Roberta, uh, Georgia, preaching at St. James, catching the bus by myself and picking me up, putting me back on the bus Sunday and going back to Macon and going to school on Monday morning. She was there. She was one of my little members <laughs> at the time. So it's what you've been called to do as a why you can't quit. Oh, yes, you want to quit. Now, a lot of you feel like you're not worthy. And that's why Jeremiah said, I'm not worthy. I'm too young. A lot of you feel like, God, what you've called me to do, I'm not qualified. And you start saying, I'm not qualified to sing. I can't sing. And why pastor want me in the choir? I don't do praise and worship. Why he put me on this? I don't know how to pray. You know how to pray. Catch enough trouble, you'll pray. Trouble teach you how to pray. I can't do the thing the pastor want me to do. I don't know how to usher. You know how to smile. You know how to say welcome. You're not, God's not calling you because you are worthy. God is not using you because you deserve what you're getting. He sees something in you he wants to use. Not what people want, but what he wants. You may not be able to give a lot of money, but the little you give, give that. See, pay your tithes and stop tipping God. And don't worry about what people can give more than you. It's plenty in a penny. <laughs> Am I right about it? You got to remember, pennies make dollars. A lot of you all throw away pennies, but I keep all my pennies. <laughs> I put them in old big old jug of water, jug, and I just throw all my change in there, and that's my Christmas money. <laughs> Amen? I don't throw away change. I keep it and put it in a little jar and save it. And that, that's your money. That's how you learn how to have your Christmas money. You take what little you have and use it. You know you won't have no money Christmas. So you better save a little bit, put a dollar or two down right now. Going on a trip, when things open up, start saving, look for deals now. Look for all this time, all these uh, offers been out there and prices been low. That's for you to plan a trip for the next two years. 
while it's cheap. Amen. You're not qualified. Look, God chose to pick some of the worst people to do his job. Abraham was too old. And God called him and said, you're going to have a baby. Amen. A hundred years old. And she 90. <laughs> and you can imagine when Abraham had this son, I can imagine all how proud he was. I'm sure when he a hundred year old got a young man, I'm sure he'd walk around. And, hey, see that boy there? <laughs> Talking around the guy. That's my son. <laughs> I'm sure the guys, you, Abraham, you know you lie. That's mine. I don't look, look like it. Look at him. Look at him. That's, that's mine. And I'm sure he bragged everywhere he went, old man bragging. Yes, sir. You know, can't beat the old man bragging. <laughs> so he bragged, and I'm sure that's 100 years old. But he was old. Yes, was. He wasn't worthy of that. She was 90. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, she just woke up and had morning sickness and didn't know what it was. At that age. And she's pregnant. God picked him because he wanted to use it. God picked a man who, who got drunk. Noah got drunk. He had a little too much juice. Maybe he had been uh, tired of uh, that ark so long and been up there with all those stinking elephants and things. And, and he got out of there, old Noah said, I need a break. <laughs> I need a drink. <laughs> and Noah got drunk after the flood. Jacob was a trickster. Yes, he was. And his Israel is named after him. Right. He was named Israel. Yes. Jacob. Yes, and he was a trickster. Beat his brother out of his birthright. Yes. David was an adulterer. Yes. Had a man killed and took his wife. Yes. And you're talking about qualifying? Yes. Paul was a persecutor. Yes. And he's the mightiest man that God ever picked that spread the gospel around the world to the Gentiles. Yes, Peter lied and swore they didn't know him and Thomas doubted him. Yes, Judas betrayed him. Yes, but Jesus picked him. Yes, Jonah tried to hide from him and run from him. Yes, oh yeah. Oh, Moses yes. killed a man yes, and God called him at the backside of the desert. Yes, they were not perfect or qualified, but what made God use them? Because God wants somebody who's usable. You say you can't be used. God say, I want somebody who's used. I want somebody that doesn't feel like they're all this and that. Because when God mold you, he'll make you and shape you into what he wants you to be, not what you want to be. And God can't use all these giants. God got to get some midgets in here. Because all you giants, see, I told a young preacher, I said, young man, I said, he asked me about preaching and how what's the, uh, my secret to preaching to my success. I said, I preach with simplicity. He said, I said, I preach purposely with simplicity. When I go in a pulpit, I want to be Profound but simple. I don't want to get out there using all these words that people can't understand. He said, Well, why? I said, Watch the greatest preacher of all, Jesus. He spoke and the common people heard him. He didn't go above the head. He said, Why? I said, Son, everybody in the church, not giraffes. They can't reach up there and grab it. Jesus brought it so simple. He was the greatest preacher. And you know he knew words because he was the word. And if you the word, you know words. But he spoke on the level. He was like Charles Hardy Spurgeon. I said, one thing you have to make up in your mind, young preacher, what kind of preacher do you want to be? Do you want to be a crowd pleaser for upper class or the people preacher? There are two kind of preachers you can be. You can be a theologian and use all these Theological words that the people don't understand, Greek and Hebrew, that's good to know. But do you want to be a scholar preacher to preach to the high echelon and the blue blood? Or do you want to get down and be a people preacher? 
Charles Harder Spurgeon didn't have all the degrees. It's not I'm against that, but he knew how to preach the people. And he was the greatest preacher since Paul. Charles Harder Spurgeon, preaching with simplicity. And shook the world because he was a people preacher. People make take care of you, not scholars. They'll invite you over to speak to them, but they don't take care of your members going to pay your bill, brother. Your members going to take care of your family. And you need to be concerned. Are you making that word acceptable that they can understand? And don't worry about these theologians because they won't be there when your rent got to be paid. Uh, that's called preacher talking. I'm talking to young preachers now that go on to the seminary and have become a cemetery. Amen. This pool pit is a pool pit. You got to pool in this pit. And if you don't pool in this pit, you'll be in a pit sure enough. I'm teaching now. <clears throat> I'm talking about how to preach with fire. Fire in your bones. Not in just your head. Whatever you get, get it in your bones. You know, you've heard somebody, you know you've said somebody, I love that Negro to bone. Why you say you, why you say you love him to the bone? <laughs> because your bone is more important than anything in your body. That's what's holding your frame up. Your bone, your 208 bone holding up everything. It, it protects your organs on the inside. Your, your frame, this is a vital part of your body, and it's shielded by your bone. Amen? Your legs holding you up. Your bones are crucial. Your bones, that's the thing run down your spinal cord, not just your muscles. Your muscles play a great role, but you saw something that went through your eyes and went through your rectum and it went through your brain and it got interpreted through electrons and it ran down your spinal cord and made your hand react to what you want and start running when you want to run because it went down to the lower part of your kidney and make your knee shake your bone. So while you got happy, you start doing this and Something went down your rectum, down your spinal cord, and hit the lower part of your kidney and made your knees shake and made you go to wiggling your toes. Your bone. I love the Lord in my heart, but I want him in my bone. That's a little physic right there. Why well, you saw somebody and you said, wow, wow, wow. It went through your eyes and it made you have butterflies and made you wiggle your toes. <laughs> You all acting like you so holy you never said all that. You know you looked at somebody and said, mm mm. And then you just like Brother Amen looked at one and said, Lord, how much. <laughs> all right, let me get to the application of my message, unless I be too long. Why did Jeremiah say he wanted to quit? <clears throat> First of all, he was more worried about what the church folk thought of him and the crowd thought of him than God. He wanted people approval. They didn't like his message and they turned on Jeremiah. They didn't like it when he was going after them in Judah about straying away from God and false, following these false gods and they didn't like the sermon. They didn't like, they wanted Jeremiah to tell them everything was fine. People don't like hearing the truth. And then they get mad at you for not telling them the truth. Amen. A lady told a lady one time, she said, now, tell me the truth. You, my friend, how my hair look? She said, well, if you want me to be your friend, it looks a mess. Then she got mad and said, I thought you were my friend. <laughs> Why you tell, I thought you were my friend. She said, you asked me to tell you how I look. Now, do you want me to tell you it looks so beautiful? It looked like it's floating in the sun and in the, in the air and look like it's a rose blooming. Or do you want me to tell you the truth, baby? It's tore up. <laughs> now, I tell you a lie. But I'm your friend. Your friend will tell you the truth if you can take it. 
But some of y'all rather hear loud, oh, it's beautiful, and then go to looking at the others. So, mm, mm, mm. You, know, you know how you all do. <laughs> Talking with your eyes. <laughs> I just didn't want to hurt the feeling. A true friend, a true friend would take, but uh, see, a true man of God and a real pastor will be humble with you, but won't play with you when it comes to what God telling him to do. I'm a nice down-to-earth pastor. I speak to anybody. I talk to anybody that's talk to me, but don't come challenging me about this pulpit. Don't come playing with me on certain things that I don't play on. When it comes to this pulpit and me being an authoritative pastor who runs this church that you don't have to worry about, it, I don't play. I will send you out of here in a minute. Because when it comes to my job, I'll tell you Mary Martha in a minute. You can go and stay, but don't hear the point. When it comes to God's business, you don't play with enemies. You don't play about what God wants you to do. You can't always be a crowd pleaser. You have to tell for what they don't like hearing. If you are a man of God. And you can't be a leader and play with people. I tell preachers, be a lamb on the floor and a lion in the pulpit. You got to remember that because the devil not playing. The devil not playing. And people think you're playing with them as a weakness. You play with a baby too much, what happens? And I tell you, if you keep letting him hit at you, he will hit you. We got a little grandbaby there, and I got a little board there. I haven't put on there yet. When he gets older, it's going to call the Board of Education. And so when he go to acting foolish, and call, we done spoil him. So the flame, I get that board in a minute, and he'll act like he'll run in that kitchen. Which he, I told you don't go in there. He'll wait till her back turn. He'll go in there, and she grab that board. He'll turn around there and go back and sit down. I'm telling you, right now, and then he'll look at me. I said, don't look at me. <laughs> so I put a board on you, too. <laughs> so the point is, you got the teacher. You play with a child, he'll treat you like a child. There, and I've seen his mother do the same thing. This is the way you raise children. They have to be trained. And they don't like that, but that's called parenting. You teaching them what life is. How do you all know this, that mothers are mean? How come mother so mean? Go ahead, sit down. <laughs> How come mother so mean? And in the house, they look like they get meaner. Get out of the kitchen. <laughs> Have you heard the folk talk to you like that? Mama just so mean. Mama, why you so mean? Go somewhere and sit down. <laughs> then you go to dad and go do what mama said, boy. <laughs> You know why mothers are mean? She's a trainer. She's like an eagle. She tears up a nest. You know why? She know the day is coming when you're going to be out here in a real world. And it's not playing. And you can't play. That mother tears up the nest from the eagle because a storm coming. And if they don't learn how to fly and she don't stir up and get them out, that storm's going to kill them. It's going to blow those little eagles away. She's been where you're going. And she knows what's out there. It's, no me. it's a mean world. And you got to be prepared how to deal with it. And telling you what you want to hear is not going to help you. That's why she, her mother is mean. She's a trainer. The best teachers are always the mean teachers. Amen. So you're not perfect. And when mama holler, hollering at the young man, she get on your nerve. When you get old, you're going to say, my mama put the board on me. My mother taught me. And you're going to remember those things because you're going to be a mother one day and a father one day. And you're going to be hollering about, my mama didn't take that. There's a time, some stuff I see going on now. We didn't see that when I was a child. We didn't see no child calling you by no first name. 
and I was coming up, a lady down on the street caught you acting bad. She whipped you and sent you home and called your mother and said, I caught your child and you got home and got another whipping. But they weren't stabbing principals and they weren't breaking in houses and they said, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. Crowd pleaser. Then another thing why uh, Jeremiah wanted to quit, he was worried about their faces. You read Jeremiah 1 and say, God said, don't be afraid of their faces. And some of you all can't enjoy a church from worrying about, she looked at me funny. <laughs> Baby, you looking funny. <laughs> Well, when I got up, they just rolled their eyes at me. I, I didn't mean to make a blunder when I said, don't worry about them looking at you. They couldn't stand up there and do half what you did. When you made a little error, it, don't worry about that. If somebody laughed, I'll like try them up here. When you get up here, you'll get nervous. Some people say that preacher made some radical error. He said, why don't you try preaching up here? Why don't you get up here and see how well you, I don't think you'll last two minutes. You don't know what it's like when all eyes are on you. And sometimes I don't have any notes. And there are times I make an error, but you got to look beyond those things because you can't always get it together like you want it. It's, a, it's tension when all people are looking at every little mistake you make. It's tension when some folk come to you and say, uh, well, you kind of get used to insults. If you're going to preach and laugh like me. I got you, You're going to preach 46 years at one church and be preaching 50 some years and then pastor six church. Mount Carmel is my sixth church. I pastored five churches prior to you. I had a church in Decatur and one in Macon before I came to Mount Carmel. Had three when I was in Macon. And all those years I pastored and called a little boy, can't tell me nothing about older folk. They made me and mold me into the kind of pastor I am that don't play. Because they said I was a kid and a kid can't lead us grown folk. And I had to show them that I was a young boy, preacher, but I was able to pastor. And guess what? They left Summer Hill and followed this young man to Camelton Road and built the church from the ground because they saw in me leadership. Not a boy when I first went there called me a little boy. I got to preach one time when I came to Mount Carmel or Deacon Hollis said, that ain't nothing but a boy. Oh, my deacon son, that's all right. You just wait in a few minutes. And when I got through preaching in there, they were taking him out. Then he came back in there crying, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to call you a boy, but you were preaching to the little boy I ever seen. <laughs> I had to take those insults. You can't worry about people, listen, preacher, want to leave your church. How many times I had people come to me and tell me, we're leaving. And what am I supposed to do? See, well, I didn't say Mary Martha them, but I said it on the inside. Mary Martha, you know what my pastor means say Mary Martha? Old Mary, don't you weep? Martha, don't you moan? Pharaoh's army and got drowned. I'm not worried about you. I've seen them go and come when I first came here. 530 members joined the church here in the first year in summer here. And half of them were gone by the time I started pastoring. They were busting out the walls. Not who leaving, who you still got left. The point is this. They didn't like the pastor changing things. And the old crowd rose up and fought me because they didn't want to change nothing. I said, but you got to change. We got to move for the new day. I could not allow folk who left stop me. And if you are called by God, you don't quit because of their mean faces. Let them look at you. I preached in church and my face was so cold I was almost scared to take a text. Folk will just look at you. You can't worry about faces on a job. 
People staring at your mud are funny. People frowning when they see you. The Bible said, don't let their faces bother you, Jeremiah. Because some folk will look at you crazy in church. If you say amen, you got to look at somebody when they shout, you shout and they can't stand it, shout all of them. Because they don't know. It's not about your face, it's God's face. Just to behold his face, not your face. I know what God has done for you, me, and you didn't do it. You didn't wake me up. You weren't around when I was down and didn't know what to do. And why am I worrying about your face looking at me because I got happy? Some of you all right now can't work on a job. They look at me funny. They, they, they roll their eyes. They roll them back and say, good evening. While they rolling, I went and preached to the church in New York. Man, there were some faces there that would scare you to death. And I got up and said, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to preach regardless whether you all want to say amen or not. And I went on that level. I went on that level. I went to talking some stuff up there in front of them. They didn't think I knew. And when I got through on that level, I said, now let's go down south. Before I knew it, they were falling all out, running all over the place. Because I was not intimidated because there was scholarship there. I was not intimidated. I've been to school some. Yes, so the point is, the point is, do you have the God? We didn't come here to show off who we are, doctor this, doctor that. Yes. You're a brother and a sister. In the house of God. And your soul need to be saved. And your money won't do it. Your faith won't do it. Don't be mad about folk faces. If you all get up the same praise team and folk just look at you funny, sing harder. Sing harder. Sing harder. And then if they bother their face, bother you that much. Turn and look somewhere else and look at God. <laughs> Somebody looking at you now, shouting. You need to shout that, baby, I wish you could get what I got. Don't worry about their faces and that'll make you want to quit. It'll make you want to quit when people don't want to get with you. It'll make you want to quit when you got your own kinfolk won't support you. It'll make you want to quit when your own people you help don't want to support you. It'll make you want to quit when you know you've done your best to try to help somebody and they're ungrateful and not showing no gratitude for all you've given and all you've done. Don't worry about it. God is still protecting you. God is still blessing you. And God's still giving you good health. If you stop letting the devil use people's face, how many people came to me and told me uh, we, outgrowing, we outgrew the ministry? <laughs> we moving on. We're not fed. You know why I told one? You know why you're not fed? You don't like what's on the menu. And a lot of times a kid won't eat it because they don't like what's on the menu. They don't like hearing the word. They don't want to hear it like it is. And they don't like it because then they go somewhere where they tell it like they want to hear it, then they eat. But I got news for you. I'm the kind of preacher that when I see you sick with a cold, I'm going to give you some spiritual cast oil. You may not like it, but it'll do the trick. <laughs> Amen. Jeremiah said, my time running out, and I don't have time to get to what I want to say. It's like fire in my bone because what fire does? Fire warms you. Are you cold? Get this fire in your bone. Has the devil froze your amen? Has he taken away your joy? Is that froze? That you don't have that joy of the Lord anymore? That you can't smile no more? Your smile is froze? Get around some fire. 
Get some fire in your bones and it'll loosen you up because fire will warm you. It's some cold spirits. The devil want to kill your praise, but get the fire in your bones and it'll warm up your praise. Fire will bring out what's real. If you don't know if gold is real, don't put no water and bleach on it. That won't do it. Do you know when people are real, it's based on what they can take, not what you can't take. When you can take stuff, you're real. Because real trouble shows you are a real, genuine Christian. How do you know you're a child of God till things go bad? Put some fire to it. Put that gold. I told you I, I, I bought some jewelry one day <laughs> and I had a gold chain around my neck. And I went to Judd and I went to the Holy Land and went to the Dead Sea. And Ricky, that thing was looking good. It always shine. But when that chemicals in that Dead Sea you know you don't you don't you don't float. You just go in a big old sea. You just lie down and float. You can't drown. It's full of potash, full of chemicals. The Dead Sea, unused, the lowest part in the world. All the water running into the Dead Sea and never go out. It's such an important body of water that the world hate the Jews for having it. And uh, a lot of healing in there. People get in there healed. But a lot of my members, just old people couldn't swim. They got, I'm floating. And I just laugh. But don't get in there with no cheap jewelry. All those chemicals can get in there. And I came out of that thing with <laughs> faded. That's <laughs> one of that piece of jewelry. <laughs> I thought that thing was real. They pay, I paid good money. I thought it was real gold. That stuff proved it. It had torn colors around my neck. <laughs> I want to go back and find that joke and have sold it to me. <laughs> Somebody that's real gold. Listen, when you take fire and put it to gold, it doesn't fade it, it makes it shine. And God will let you go through hard things to show if you are a real Christian. If you're going to quit going to church because things not going right, if you're going to quit going and get out the choir because some folk in there are mad and you all heard about, I don't like being around all this mess, and you go to church and you go to work every day around all that mess, and some of you even living at home around all that mess, but then you want to get out of everything in God's house because you don't like mess. Where's your real testimony? The trials that God puts you through will test your love. Who you trying to impress? People? Who you trying to get to love you? People? Or do you love you? Do people have to tell you how great you are to make you feel important? Then God going to let them disappoint you to show you you're not real. If somebody going to leave you because a few errors make, they ain't love you that much. Because when they really love you, they'll put up with some stuff. They need to put up with you because you're putting up with them. When you don't have no money and broke, and I had a lady, I hate to say it, she was faithful, young, beautiful couple. When I first came here, he looked so nice, and she did. They would sit right over there. And all of a sudden, years went by, I didn't see him anymore. And I was sitting in my office, and they said, somebody came to see you, Pastor. I said, who? One of your old members. She came in like this. And a sister was with her. I said, what happened to you? Sit down. She sat down. She said, hey, Brother Pastor, I've been up north with my sister. I said, wow, what happened? She said, I had a stroke. 
I said, where is it? Your husband was so loyal. He said to me he wasn't going to babysit. And he left me. I looked at her and I said, look at me. She looked, I said, look at me. You came as a friend you ain't never had. I said, his love wasn't real. She held her head head up. I said, you still here. Let him go on. She looked up again in tears. I said, no, 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 no. Don't cry. Smile. It took this to show you what he was about. As long as you had that big job, making that money, making over $100,000 a year, and you were bringing in, oh, yeah, they love you. But his love got tested. Sometimes, and she perked up, and I understand she started doing better. She needed to hear somebody say, let him go. Yes, and move on, baby. Yeah. I said, you could have been dead. But God provided you a sister. <laughs> God helped me today. <laughs> that standing right there to see about you. God was sending somebody to hold you together. You don't have to sit around and die because folk want you to die. You don't have to give up because people don't want to support you. Support yourself. Take yourself out. Order what you want to eat. Yeah. And be nosy and hear everybody else's conversation. <laughs> you got nobody to talk to. <laughs> I take myself out a lot of time. Amen. Take yourself out. And you don't have to forsake your, your son because you and your wife broke up. Go back and get that boy. Go back and get those children because they think they're the cause. And they don't have nothing to do with them. And you need to assure them. This that has nothing to do with you all. We love you. It's just not working. And they need to know that you love them, father and mother. Don't go marry this new wife and forget your children. That's your happiness. What about them? Go back and get that boy. Go back and get that daughter. Take them out. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you right now, the grown man we're killing people. I saw it on TV the other day. I can't think of his name. David somebody. He was a most famous, handsome little young a boy, and he was a great singer, and women and girls were screaming over him, and, and it had a stampede one time just coming to see it, and all his life, all his life, as famous as he was, the millions of fans that he had, he never loved himself. He got to be 68 years old and was drank himself to death. And the press and everybody was shocked to hear all these years, all the women you had, all the women that wanted you, what's wrong with you? My daddy never threw his arms around me. And they said his daddy was jealous of him because he outdid his dad. And the daddy was active too. Just wanted a father. To hug him. Whew, can you believe it? That rich died an alcoholic. All those years from a teenager just wanted his daddy to say, son, you're doing a great job. This is important. What if you don't have a father to tell you that? What if your mother never told you good things? Tell yourself you are. Tell yourself I'm somebody. But you know why you need to get over what your grown folk do? I'm talking to children looking at me now. You don't supposed to stay that long, no how. Help me, Holy Ghost. <laughs> but you hollering about my mama, my mama. They just raised you to get out. I said, grown and go, go together. If you stay there, you gonna soon meet somebody or some boy or some girl and be gone. And they're going to still be there by themselves when you are going on with your life. That's right. That's right. Don't worry about them. Focus on what you're going to be as you grow up. And your children are going to do the same when you get old. Grow up and leave. Yes. Yes. I just helped somebody. Yes. They're sitting around mad because of what happened with mom and daddy. 
Amen. 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 I didn't know I was going this way. God took over this sermon today. You have to focus on your career. What you want to be, not what your mama wants you to be. What you want to be. Because they're only raising you so you can raise your own. Whoa. Where did this come from? Another thing I got, why you want some fire in your bone? Fire will spread. If somebody in the church hot and fiery, it's supposed to move on somebody else. That's why if you want to get happy, go to a happy church. <laughs> and if you want to be miserable, go to a miserable church. You know why? It'll spread on you. It's, and, and, and people getting happy, feeling the Lord, you start feeling it. Because you can't get around fire and fire in your bone that won't spread on somebody else. Do you know what caused the great fire of Chicago, America, that nearly burned down the whole city? A cow in a barn with a lady kick over the lamp in the barn. And that one little cow kick, famous cow kick, the lamp over the woman's light. It caught a fire in the barn, and it spread that fast. And nearly burned down Chicago. That's how the Holy Ghost is. A little bit of fire will go to spread. And it'll light up over here and light up over there. Then the whole church on fire. Somebody need a cow to kick something over here. Now. Can I get an amen back there and get a kick? Can I get a hand way back there? Y'all kick something over and let the whole church. Catch on fire! Fire in my bone. And folks say, what you getting happy about? I, I can't help it. I feel something. And everybody in here feeling what I feel. Fire is spreading. Then something else about when you got fire in your bone, it'll help you see in the dark. Start a fire. When they didn't have no electric lights, how did they see? They would light up something. A little kerosene lamp. <laughs> Suppose something happened and a tornado comes in here and tap thing. You better keep one. I got one in my, one in my little storage house. <laughs> I bought it and I just keep it. Kerosene heater too. They sold it, sold them at Lowe's. Just sit it there. You might need it. You might have to cook on it. You never know what's going to happen. They just witnessed that in, in, in Texas. And everything gone. People had nothing. You may have to learn how to build a house. People just dug a hole in there and built a house. Know how to be a carpenter. You don't know what can happen when you lose all your plumbing. I'm trying to prepare you to deal with the unexpected. I got to read. Light will help you see. When you got the fire of God in you and that fire in your bone, it'll let you see stuff you never thought you could see. It'll let you look through hate and see love. Look through confusion and see peace. Look through a desert and see a flower garden. When you, when you got the light of God in you, it'll open your eyes to certain things. You'll see the enemy working. You'll see the devil trying to stop you. It'll expose demons when you got the light around you. The light exposes your false friend. You look through that smile and see they're no good. Light exposes it. Don't mess with a child of God. When they got light, they'll see through you, baby. That's what light would do. When the children of Israel were going through the wilderness, the, there was a cloud of fire leading them every step of the way because God wanted to expose the vipers. So when you're walking in the dark, some snakes don't rattle. So God gave you some light. So when you see a snake, an old viper friend, an old viper loved one, an old viper false friend in your face, and you got that Bible, and you got that light, 
It exposed that joker. <laughs> God help me the Holy Ghost. God exposed these snakes that are waiting out there. These demons got traps to try to destroy you. You got that light. When you get near them and expose them, oh, there's a snake there. When you got that light, it'll turn the light on. Y'all need to put some light on your situation. One of the things about light, fire, have you noticed, fire goes up. It don't ever go down. Now, fire just, when a fire starts, isn't it amazing? It goes upward. A replica of God. It goes upward. God wants you to go up. Go on up in grace. Go on up in love. When you got fire in your bones, it makes you want to look upward. I always like to notice that fire go up when it catch on fire. And you as a child of God, when you catch on fire, you're supposed to be going to another level. Then I need to tell you this, lest I hold you too long again. Fire just make you, it'll burn up some stuff. It, 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 if you got fire in your bone, it'll burn up some habits. When you got fire in your bone, it'll burn up some attitudes you got. When you got fire in your bone, it'll burn up stuff that used to hold you back. It'll burn up your bad past. It'll burn up the enemy that tried to harm you. Fire will burn up some stuff, and it'll burn up your attitude too. Look, you need to fire your ball so that fire can burn out some stuff and burn out some stuff. And that's why you can praise God today. That's why you can lift your hand today. You need to tell for fire burn off some stuff. It's in my bone. And it burn off some people that I couldn't get over. You know, the fire, the fire God will burn these folk off you. Oh, God, y'all ain't ready for, you all not ready. Fire kills germs. Huh? Fire kills germs. How you kill germs? Why you want hot water? Kill germs, right? And if you want to get the fire God and get rid of some germy folk, Some folk, when you catch when you catch germs, you catch theirs. If you're hanging around somebody lying, they'll have you lying. So you done caught that germ. They got a cold, now you got one. Tell somebody, get some fire on it. Put some fire to these germs and it'll burn off. You don't want to kill germ with cold water. You want some hot water. You need some fire in your life to kill off some germy folk. So when they get you, they'll have you looking sick and you say, ain't nothing wrong with me. You around depressed folk, looking depressed all day. When you come home, you're going to be When you around somebody, don't ever smile. Always looking like they got a cold. They'll have you, baby, looking so bad, you won't know you look bad until you looked in the mirror. <laughs> and you start saying, my God, I haven't smiled. I, can't, I don't like nothing funny. You know, people mean don't like to laugh. People in a church that mean and stubborn, they don't like laughing. If you notice them, I don't see nothing funny. <laughs> see, they're cold. They're bitter. Because if you laugh, it's going to break some stuff. You know when you're mad with somebody and they get you to laugh, and you go, <laughs> there you are. You release. You let go. But if they bitter and you let them make you bitter, 
you will lose your joy. That's why I don't want to be around no sad members. That's why I don't want to be around no depressed people. They'll get you depressed. You may have to get out of that house and go get you some Tyler Perry movies and watch more deal. Bitter folk don't like laughter. They like being mean. Ugly. That's what makes folks sick. Laughing is medicine. The Bible says God laughs. God didn't make us to be mean. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Joy. You know how to have joy. Look back and see what God has done for you. You know how to be happy this morning. Look back and see who healed you. Look back and see what could have happened to you and you're still together. Look back at what could have destroyed your marriage and you're still making it. Look back and see who healed you when the doctor gave up. Look back and look over some folks and some things you got over that you didn't think you'd get over. Look back and wonder how you got over. God did it. That'll make you shout. That'll make you rejoice. You're not looking back at what you used to be and what you have now. Get all that in your bones. Get some look backbone. <laughs> Get your grooves back. <laughs> Who that got? Who that you all say got the grooves back? Get your grooves back. Get it young again. Stop making gods out of people. You put them too high. Far. Far will get your attention. Oh, let me finish roll out now. When God got that fire in his bone and Jeremiah wanted to quit he had to think about some things. Who called him? He, he started thinking, he started worrying about the people who called on him and started looking at the God who called him. He started getting beyond the people criticizing him and started looking at the God who praised him. You know, if you praise God, he'll praise you. That just hit me. If you glorify God, he'll smile and say, that's mine. If you honor him, say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be, holy is your name. Then God will smile down on you and say, that's my child. What you do when they want to quit? When the fire won't let you quit, deacon. What you do when you say, well, you know, I'm not qualified. I can't pray like other folk. Pastor, why you want me on the deacon board? Call him. Call him the way you know how to call him. I often tell this, tell this little joke. One deacon was down praying, he didn't talk well. And he got down on his knee. Um, 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 One old mother went up and shook him and said, I can't understand nothing you say. He said, I ain't talking to you. But the God I'm calling, he understands. Whether you understand me or not, I'm not talking to you. Oh! Uh, 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 don't go that way, Fleming. Oh, 
And you know what? When you got fire in your bone, fire make it move. Jeremiah said, I want to quit. I want to give up. But when I start thinking about who called me, and I go up thinking about it, I got a charge to keep and a God to glorify. He said, I want to give up. I want to throw in the towel. But the fire is in my bone. It's in my bone. I can't quit. I've been passing here, but I can't quit. I can't turn on God. Whatever you do for me next Sunday, that's all right. I can't stop the fire in my bone. And I got to remember who called me. I got to do it well. Whether you like it or not, don't you quit on God. Don't you stop on God. Hold your head up high and glorify him. Stay on the job. Praise him. I got that fire in my bone. The man flashing that light on me now. Telling me it's time to quit. But old Fleming want to take off running. I feel like running. I feel like shouting. I thank the Lord. Fire! I feel the Holy Ghost. Fire! Get all in your hands. Get all in your feet. Fire! Look at somebody say, I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. I got to stick with it. I got that fire in my bones. day of Pentecost they tarried and when that fire came down they thought the people were drunk Peter said how can we be drunk all the liquor stores are closed it's the fire of the Holy Ghost that's moving on us today they spoke in unknown tongues they praised God because the fire didn't care fire will burn up anything that's burnable So don't you quit. Don't you stop. Don't you leave your church. Don't get out no choir. Don't get off no usher board because you got to know who you're doing it for. You're doing it for God. Get your fire back. You know what? I just thought about something. Some of you all got fire but you need that little metal piece. I remember when I was, we had a little fireplace once. And I remember the fireplace. And the fire died out. My dad had me put some more wood on the fire. And I noticed the fire died. And it looked like it had gone out. So when I went back up there, I said, Dad, the fire gone. He said, don't worry about the ashes. Just stir it. Stir it. And I began to put that little iron piece in there, whatever you call it. I can't think right now. But I stuck, huh? Well, I stuck that little poker. That's what we call it, the poker. When I stuck that poker in there and went to sticking it in there, then the fire started back. Some of y'all need to get your poker back and stick it in there and stir that fire. Get your praise back. Get your glory back. Get your hallelujah. Stir up the fire. And the fire will stir back the burden. Stir it up with a prayer. Stir it up with a soul. Stir it up with a testimony. Stir it back up. Get your fire back. Maybe somebody needs to get happy at home right now. Get out of your sadness and rejoice. Thank God you're still here.
try to tell you he's defeating you that he wants you to quit and give up you got to look that devil in the face and tell him Satan there's no way you're going to stop me when I got this thing in my bone I got fire in my bone I got God's fire in my bone and you can't put it out the devil wants to put out your fire the devil wants to kill you I want you to be sad and miserable and upset. And he wants to stress you out. We're closing by telling you, look, get, don't let stress kill you. Stress is a killer. And the devil wants to bring up your past, stress you out, think about people who hurt you, to get you where you can't sleep. This is what the devil wants to take you to sleep. You need to go to sleep. And why should you go to sleep? Why should you be up when he that watches over you doesn't slum or not sleep? God said, no need to both of us being up. God said, I'm already up. You go to sleep. God's watching over you. God got your back. How you made it this far? How did you make it through all that you've been through? Have you thought about what you've been through? And you still here? Do you know some stuff you've been through would have killed most folk? You need to shout and glorify God that God brought you through some stuff some folk don't know nothing about. And you tell them I can't quit praising him this morning. It's fire in my bones. I'm still here. You still here. Thank you so much. Wow. You know, the message this morning went in all kind of directions that I didn't plan. But now I see why God changed me from preaching verses and just put me on this. I didn't want to preach this. I was going to come back in my verses. We got to know you're not preaching the verses you want. You're going to preach what they need to hear today. Just get some look back fire. That makes me get happy. Why are you still here?
Don't worry about nobody looking at you shout. They don't know your story. They don't know when you want to just throw your head, probably want to commit suicide and kill yourself. No, God shield you. They don't know what you've experienced. And some of it's so deep you don't want to tell nobody. But God knows. And he shields you. And Jeremiah looked back and Jeremiah said, I got a fire in my bones. I want to quit, but I can't. You might want to quit going to church because somebody hurt your feelings. Get that fire back. Get back. Go back to the church that hurt your feelings. And tell them I'm bigger than that. Somebody disappointed you to hurt you, love them, and get over them, and tell them I'm bigger than that. Because God's still blessing you. And he could be blessing you because you didn't quit. He could be showing you favors because you didn't quit. See, God remembers. Now, this message ought to go around the world to everybody. Because right now, people in this pandemic are throwing their hands up. Mad at God because somebody probably died in the family with COVID. Let me say something about that real quiet. And you probably really hurt. It's just life. It's a pandemic. A pandemic here, nothing about who it is. There's nothing you did wrong. It's just a pandemic. And if you look back in history, we've had them before. Millions of people died with smallpox. The Black Plague. What do you tell them? It's for part of being a human being. Yes, sir. Viruses are in the air every day. Yes. We don't know what you're breathing. Hallelujah. There could be chemicals in your neighborhood. You don't know that they, what they're dying they're doing. Yes. You don't know how people have caught cancer because of certain chemicals in the ground that they didn't know was up under them. Right. It's just life. So you lost your brother, lost a sister, lost a child to COVID. It's life. Dying is a part of living. Animals died. We had the mad cow disease. We had certain viruses and things in certain food. Was it a cola? Big Ebola, if I'm saying it right. Yeah, there have been a lot of food they had to pull off. Yes, they had Ebola and all that in it. And the uh, colon and all that stuff. And they pulled the, the wedge salad off a few years ago. Yes, people were dying from that. Yes. Mad cow disease, people dying from. You don't know what's in your meat that can kill you. It's just life. And now we've experienced something that old people went through in the 1800s that wiped out thousands of people. It happened, we just didn't have the media then. They didn't have the media that we have now, that everybody know it. I told you, when I was going to Cairo, Egypt, to preach with Mandela, the bird flu hit. And they told me, you can't come here. Won't give me visa. It's been one of the greatest opportunities in the world. But me to preach with Mandela? They just never know what's going to happen. And I was going to go back to some other country to sing again, but though, I said, no, 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 I'm not coming. I talked to my deacon before he left here, Deacon Lovejoy. I'm deacon Lovejoy, you're going into all these countries. I said, you know, I've been in these countries. How you eat? What you do? He said, Reverend, I take my sandwiches and I put it all in my little bag. I eat my sandwiches every day. I said, God. He said, really? I don't eat that food. I know I was in Germany and I drank some water and that water was so good. I was in, 
Black Forest, Germany, singing. It's on YouTube. I was singing, I am a poor pilgrim of sorrow, and you can go look at it now. And that's Mary and William hollering at me in the background. Then I went to Switzerland and sing. That's on YouTube now. Longed in England singing Old Man River. But I better not eat that food. And we went to Egypt. I begged my crew, don't eat some of this food and don't drink this water. And Jackie drank some of that water and ate something and we had to rush her to the emergency room. I was scared for her because you're in another country. Your body, I don't go nowhere and drink water in another place. Now, you know what some of the best water is? In New York. <laughs> you believe not? You can drink that water all day long. They got the best transit system down there. I don't know what it is. They got the greatest filter. And you thought it would be worse there in Atlanta trying to get with New York at. But I don't drink, I don't drink tap water. I don't drink water. If you're going to drink tap water, you boil it. You don't know what's in there. Get bottled water. Amen? Because you don't know what's in nothing that can kill you. So let's just get over it. You'll see your loved ones again. We got to work through and wear your mask and get your shots. And you are the one going to make it worse by not getting your shot. It's not about you. It's protecting your other relatives. If you don't get it for you, at least get it for somebody else that you want to protect. Don't be selfish and hard-headed. COVID is a killer. And you see it daily. Young and old dying. This is evidence when you see these graves. There's no game. It's not political. Folk you know are dead. I done buried three, five members. One just died the other week. COVID. Done lost two deacons. Listen. It's just got to work our way through it. And what you need to do is just do what we have to do and work through it. Okay? Get your shots. And wear your mask. Until everybody going everywhere having fun. I know why. I saw it yesterday. Depressed. You depressed. You divorce rate is going high. People can't stand being cramped up in the house. I feel sorry for folk in these little small apartments up north. And can't go down. No wonder they're getting divorces. Fighting in the home. They pressure. Can't go nowhere. We got to do it. Until we can have get through this situation, then we can get out and go traveling and have fun. It's not ready. We not everybody not vaccinated yet. Okay, so I hope you. I, I feel in my spirit somebody looking at me mad at God because of COVID. God didn't send that. Sin brought on all this. God didn't create all this evil. Man made a choice in a garden. And sin came as a result of what? Disobedience. And right now we got a virus out of control because of folks still disobedient. And disobedient and you're not anointed, you're stubborn. Talking about you covered, not covered with nothing. Just the spirit of rebellion. That's the money. And I'm looking at some saints, and you know I'm right. I'm big enough to tell you what I want to tell you, and don't care about what you think about it. That's the spirit of rebelliousness. The Bible says, honor those who have authority over you. That's what the word said. If the government said, we supposed to obey. And somebody need to tell you, as an old pastor like me, I'm 70 years old, I'd have made the promise. Three score years and 10. Now I don't care what you say. 
Amen. I used to when I was young, but now I say what I want to say. I don't care what you think about it. That's where old folk are. <laughs> Amen. You better listen to this old preacher and get rid of that stubborn, rebellious spirit, or you be lying here. Because it's not playing. It's killing. I'm glad I got both shots and still wear my mask. Amen. It's amazing you playing come to Jesus because that was what I was going to preach. That's going to come back next time. Come to Jesus. Amen. If you're here today, we extend the invitation. I'm sorry I'm a little over time. I'm about 15, 20 minutes over my time. Today. I just got a little happy this morning. Okay. Amen. A little fire got in my boat. <laughs> so you can join the church right now and give yourself to the Lord and say, Pastor, I'm going to get my praise back. I'm going to get my fire back. I'm not going to be worried about what people look at me and say. I'm going to be thankful to God I'm still alive, okay? Thank you for tuning in today. And don't forget, next Sunday morning, the one and only Dr. Jasper William, we both started pastoring at the same age. And I didn't know it till we were talking. He's 19 years old, and I started pastoring at 19. And we both pastored the same, on the same street. Salem up street from Mount Carmel on Martin Street, and Mount Carmel on Martin Street. It's amazing. Through the years, we had our little differences, and now we've grown old out a lot of foolishness and started acting like mature preachers. But when we were young, we didn't speak. But God let us live old enough to outgrow stuff. And we renewed a relationship, and I went to support him on several projects he had. And when they were attacking him by the Aretha, I came out openly and defended him. And I spoke openly on this TV. He didn't mean it the way we took it. And black folk have lost their soul. Because we don't have the soul we once had in the home. It didn't go out. It, I defended. And he heard it. Because I don't like nobody attacking a man of God. We have lost what we used to have. The family, the home, the father, the mother, the taking care of the children. Baby raising babies now. No mother there. And we've lost what mama and dad had taught us. We need to get back and get our soul back. He was right. But it didn't, it, it came off wrong. Everybody wanted to attack. He's a man of God and a great preacher. And he's coming here next Sunday and preach. And really, he's convincing me that we are really great friends to leave his church to come over here and preach for me. I don't know if Dot is coming, but I call her this morning if she's in town. All right? So we're just going to have that you come. And next Sunday, I'll, if you come in here and you're sitting in the balcony or whatever, a lot of preachers want to come. Come on over, okay? And you can enjoy this great preaching. And he already got my bow for some reason. He asked for that. I don't know what he's going to do. He wanted to see my whole bow and look at it. So whatever it is, God's going to use this man of God. Thank you for tuning in. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. If you join in with us today as we go out, God bless you. Thank you so much, man. If you join, if you're at home, stand up and lift your hand to God right now and keep your fire. Blessing.
God bless you, and we will see you next week.